competence, the ability to completely close the velopharyngeal sphincter is required for the normal production of all but nasal consonants. Now, nasal consonants in English are M, N, and N, G. Velopharyngeal insufficiency is defined as the inability to completely close the velopharyngeal sphincter. Primary effect of velopharyngeal insufficiency is naturally if the sphincter is not closing, nasal air escape and hypernasality. Secondary effects are the speech articulation errors like distortions, substitutions, and omissions. And the end result will be the decreased intelligibility of speech. Now, this is a term that, that has been used in the recent times of intelligibility. It is uh, a um, it is a total. Uh, uh, madam, excuse me. I yeah. don't think your slides are moving, madam. You're, we are still seeing the first slide. Slides are not moving, ma'am. Madam. No, no, no. It's only, uh, yeah, now it's moving. Now it is moving. It's very slow. Maybe some problem of connection, ma'am. Now is it moving? Yes. The result is yes, decrease yes. intelligibility yes. of speech. Anatomy. Uh, phonation involves the generation of a column of air pressure passing from the subglottis into the upper airway. So uh, during a normal speech, the subglottis of vellum moves upwards and the air moves out of the mouth for our normal speech. Inadequate velopharyngeal closure allows air to escape through the nose during the generation of consonants, requiring high oral pressure, leading to inappropriate nasal resonance during speech production. Now, there are several pharyngeal closure patterns. This is interesting. Uh, most common closure pattern is the circular one, where all the three walls, the two lateral walls and the anterior vellum is closing. Coronal pattern is when the palate moves upwards only but the lateral walls are not functioning. Sagittal is the slit one where the lateral walls are functioning, but the palate is not functioning very well. Traditionally, we took the decision of surgery according to the closer patterns. Now, this is a fourth closer pass pattern of circular plus passive and switch. Now, velopharyngeal sphincter includes, as I said, the vellum, right and left pharyngeal walls and the posterior pharyngeal wall. Before I discuss further, I have to tell the word Passavant's Ridge here. This was a term described by Gustav Passavant in 1863 as a transverse forward projection on the posterior pharyngeal wall during speech in cleft palate patients. Now, interestingly, initially it was thought to be found in every palate patients, every unoperated palate patients, but later on it is the term itself has become controversial. And it has been found that it is not seen in all kinds of phonation. In certain sound making, this is found, certain not. And in different um, series, it is found in 5 to 83 percent of cases. So it is highly inconstant. This is nowadays only used for the fabrication of obturator rather than to see the velopharyngeal function itself. Etiology, etiology are multifactorial, uh, becoming structural, neurogenic, uh, mechanical interference, phenomenon specific, etc. We are interested more of this part, the clefts, soft palate, defects, palatal fistula, etc. Diagnosis of VPI is subjective and objective. Most important, and this is the hallmark of VPI, is a subjective evaluation. It is a clinical determination based upon the perceptual speech assessment by a specialized speech language pathologist. Hallmark of VPI is the presence of hypernasality on vowel production, frequently associated with nasal air escape on production of non-nasal consonants. Objective evaluation, main goals for instrumental assessment are to verify the presence, a certain status of LVP musculature, describe the degree of lateral wall and palate, palatal motion semi-quantitatively. Other information may be presence of passive and stridge, aberrant pulsation, adenoid size and abnormal speed behaviors. Objective evaluation is used in children over three years who can cooperate. It includes nasoendoscopy, multiplanar video fluoroscopy, and nasometry. I'll go over each of them. This is nasoendoscopy recommended in all patients of VPI. The endoscope is passed through the middle meters to allow a bird's eye view of the VP port. Verifies the stature of the LVP musculature by noting the presence of a notch 
or a groove on the nasal surface of the palate. This finding indicates sagittal orientation of the LVP. Nasoendoscopy, uh, the golden Kushner scale is used. The scale subjectively rates the light, right and left wall movement, right and left palate movement, and posterior wall movement. This is usually uh, described in the form of a ratio, where 0 to 1 is the uh, marking, where 1 is a complete closer, and 0 is no closer at all. Also noted are the existence of adenoids, aberrant pulsation, and estimates and gap signs. Multiplanar video fluoroscopy are used for those patients in which the LVP status is transverse or unclear. MVP is MVF is performed in anteroposterior and lateral views after instilling barium drops in the nose. Nasometry, the nasometer collects acoustic data from the oral and nasal cavities during speech. Nasometry provides an objective measure nasal lens, which is a ratio of nasal acoustic energy over nasal plus oral acoustic energy as a percentage. Last investigation is the MRI. It has not um, till date found its use in, the, in a di diagnostic tool. It is most of, more of a research tool in a VPI. So next comes the part which we are interested most, that is the treatment. Now treatment is again non-surgical and surgically. Non-surgical options in VPI are very important because the first thing that we think about when a child comes to us with uh, some kind of speech errors is a speech therapy. Speech therapy indications, uh, speech therapy per se as a VPI treatment is used only in cases of minimal VPI manifested by nasal rustle or auscultatory nasal air emission. It is also used pre and post operatively and in some cases of behavioral VPI. Adjuncts to speech therapy are nasal continuous positive airway pressure, and visual feedback, particularly in children with hearing impairment. I will also deal with this part of prosthesis, which we don't uh, find in most of the centers, but uh, the prosthesis are invaluable in managing those recalcitrant cases and in some cases where surgery is contraindicated. I'll come to that later. Uh, there are two, three different types of processes that depends upon the amount and quality of palliative tissues and the finding of on nasoendoscopy. In long unscarred vellum, we use palatal lift. In short scarred vellum with a deep pharynx, we use velopharyngeal obturator. Vellum is long, but the pharynx is deep. Combined lift and obturator called liftorator. Next, these are the, this is one of the picture of the palatal lift and this is a picture of the speech bulb or obturator. Surgery are three main procedures, palatal, palatopharyngeal and pharyngeal procedures. Palatal procedures include Farlow's double opposing Z-plasty and intravellar veloplasty. These procedures lend in the palate and reposition the LVP. These procedures are appealing because they are designed to optimize the function of the muscular palate and carry a low risk of obstructive complications. Palatopharyngeal procedures involve attachment of the pharyngeal uh, constrictor muscles to the vellum, creating two lateral ports. The width of the flap may be modified to suit the patient's needs. This remains the workhorse of VPI management. Pharyngeal procedures are two types pharyngoplasties and pharyngeal augmentations and injections. There are also many variations of pharyngoplasty. So any protocol for management of BPI. Now comes the major problem. What to decide about the protocol? Since everything is different in every patient, it is very difficult different, the surgeries are different, the post assessment is different for the students that this surgery, so I have, I will be showing which are very commonly and uh, this is a point where you will find only sphincter pharyngoplasty is mentioned. There is no mention of pharyngeal flap. But I've kept this protocol because one thing is very important here, whether there is obstructive sleep apnea present or not. 
when we examine a patient with velopharyngeal insufficiency, the first thing we have to notice whether the patient already has an OSS or not. Because almost 30 to 40% of cleft palate patients per se have obstructive sleep apnea. If the patient has a diagnosed obstructive sleep apnea, we do not operate. Because any procedure we are going to do to lengthen the palate or attach the palate to the posterior pharyngeal wall is invariably going to increase the obstructive sleep apnea. So in those cases, speech processes actually plays a very important role. So if there is no OSS or uh, not any significant OSS for which a sleep study is warranted, then we go in for a nasoendoscopy to assess the LVP. Uh, depending on the VP gap size and the pattern of closer and the speech assessment, we do our management. Now I'll come to the protocol which we usually follow in our institute. This is uh, the Changang uh, Center's protocol. We have simplified it. Uh, so this is based on mainly two things, the perceptual speech assessment and the naso nasoendoscopy. Now in speech assessment, if we find a normal resonance, and in nasoendoscopy, if we find the VP port adequate, then we do a regular follow-up, no surgery. When uh, there is hypernasality, we do a nasoendoscopy again. And depending upon the type of closure, if there is marginal closure, that is port close most of the time, closure ratio 0 0.9 to 0 0.8, we do a furloughs. If it is inadequate, failure of port closure, closure ratio 0 0.7 to 0, we do a superiorly based pharyngeal flap. Uh, the width of the flap depends upon the ratio. The lower the ratio, the wider the flap. Choice of procedure. This is another for sphincter. Weak lateral wall movement, stronger palatal function. We can go in for sphincter pharyngoplasty. Asymmetric defect, again, superiorly based flap or unilateral sphincter pharyngoplasty. Double opposing Z plasty is a fallos. Fallos, uh, it is a typical 60 degree Z plasty of nasal and uh, mucosal flaps, which we all know, so I'm not describing this one. I'll come to the pharyngeal flap. Pharyngeal flap uh, aims to develop a central flap of tissue to obturate the midline of the pharyngeal port and decrease the degree of air escape into the nasal cavity. Shoebone first described this procedure in 1876 as an inferiorly based flap. He himself later modified into a superiorly based flap because an inferiorly based flap tended to contract and tether the palate downwards over time, worsening the patient's VPI. This is a typical pharyngeal flap. Flap is raised down to the level of the prevertebral fascia, creating a tissue flap of superior constrictor muscle with its overlying mucosa. This flap is raised superiorly so that its base is at the level of the arch of C1. Now, the palate is usually split in the midline to provide a better access to the nasopharynx during creation of the flap. The flap is after suturing of the flap to the nasal surface, uh, the palate is sutured back. Sphincter pharyngoplasty, uh, sorry. One thing is uh, this type of flap, the width of flap and the length of flap has undergone a long evolution. I think starting from shoe bone, uh, there has been va various degrees of length lengthening of the flap, saying that the flap is dynamic by incorporating muscle into the flap, raising the flap from very different positions, uh, from uh, very higher up flap to the lower third of the adenoids to lower down flaps, to the chen's flap, which is essentially again uh, an inferiorly based flap. Flap attachment has also been different. Uh, like Robert Mann has used it in a more uh, in a fish mouse appearance rather than splitting the palate. To the most recent, which we actually use here, is uh, described by Professor Mukund Reddy uh, as a suspension palatoplasty, where he's raising the flap much higher up from the lower third of the adenoids and attaching it into the furrows rather than splitting the soft palate. So there are variations, but essentially all are superiorly based pharyngeal flaps. And the surgeon, it is up to the surgeon's comfort and the experience to use from where he will raise the flap. Sphincter pharyngoplasty is advantageous when coronal or circular closure is present and lateral pharyngeal wall motion is deficient. 
goal is to develop a more functional sphincter by improving dynamics and bulk of velopharyngeal tissues, tightening and reducing the size of the velopharyngeal opening. Hines was the first one described in 1950, two superiorly based flaps comprising the right and the left salpingopharyngeous muscle and overlying mucosa elevated. Flaps were rotated 90 degree and sutured to the mucosal edges of a transverse incision made across the nasopharynx just before, below the level of the tori tuberine. Modifications are the orticotia. Orticotia in 1968 described using two superiorly based flap comprising the posterior tonsillar pillars with the underlying palatopharyngeous muscle. A small inferiorly based posterior pharyngeal wall flap was elevated and the two lateral flaps were rotated 90 degree and inserted into the posterior flap. Jackson and Silverton again uh, modified this by raising the flap from higher up and saving the lateral flaps into a superiorly based posterior pharyngeal wall flap. Pharyngeal augmentation procedures are uh, those autogenous tissues and foreign implants like silicon has been used. Indications are presence of a persistent gap in the central velopharyngeal port measuring max 1 to 3 millimeter. When the patient can achieve touch closer that is not tight enough to prevent air escape with high oral pressure and persistent post adenoidectomy. <coughs> Coming to the complications, in pharyngoplasty, more superiorly raised palatopharyngeal flaps lead to a greater degree of VP obturation. If this is excessive, OSA can develop. Long term complications are shrinkage and nasopharyngeal scarring. Stenosis can also result. <coughs> Resultant upper airway and nasal obstruction may require revision pharyngoplasty with tissue grafts. Pharyngeal flaps have complications, post-operative airway complication, most likely <coughs> within first 24 hours. Failure to improve related to inadequate flap width. And conversely, a flap that is too wide narrows the lateral ports and produces hyponasal speech. <coughs> Outcomes are varied. I couldn't find a single meta-analysis or systematic review which is actually saying that this procedure improves this surgery. <coughs> the last meta-analysis that I found was in 2012, Collins, <coughs> and where they have found both pharyngeal flaps, Z-plasty and pharyngoplasty has 70 to 90 percent improvement of speech. There is so much heterogeneity of data, it is very difficult to find a specific guideline, but it can be said with careful patient selection, all the three procedures are viable options for VPI. There is no consensus guide to select the optimal surgical treatment. So it depends upon surgeon to surgeon and center to center to develop their own protocol. I think that is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chattopadhyay. Very uh, nicely covered. So, uh, after uh, repairing the cleft palate, uh, how do you proceed in your institute uh, to detect this uh, PPI and uh, uh, decide when to operate it? It's a practical aspect which we uh, all the centers may not be knowing. So, for the benefit of pages yes, at your pace, Actually, you will follow. Usually in our, our institute, we do the palettes before one year of age, nine months to one year of age, palette is completed. After yeah. that, we follow them up every year. At around two and a half to three years, we do a perceptual speech recording. We so have we follow that, with the uh, palette uh, uh, physiotherapy and uh, uh, speech therapy following the palate surgery. Ma initially, initially, at one year, there cannot be any speech therapy as such. But at around two and a half to three, when the children have begun to talk, we, we have a standard assessment. Standard speech assessment is done once. So based on that, if there is some gross problem, then we say that the child might need surgery or be sent for the speech therapy to start at around three, at around three. 
but ma'am very practically before 4 to 5 years the children are not very conversant with speech therapy and yeah. it is not possible yeah. for them so at yeah. around 5 years of age speech therapy is properly started they have an access uh, if they can get some online speech therapy done because okay. they are very far away usually after 5 years we get them back we do a speech assessment and we do a nasal endoscopy if the port is large in nasal endoscopy then only we go for a video fluoroscopy otherwise only nasal endoscopy is done okay and whatever pharyngeal surgeries are done that is after 5 years of age okay so do you select uh, depending upon different uh, uh, palates the incomplete palate and yeah, the soft palate cleft only and the hard complete uh, cleft and group 3 clefts of uh, in uh, which procedure you select according to your uh, this thing palate surgery ma'am it is as i showed whatever be the primary surgery depending upon the port size if it is less than 0.7 oh, you are telling uh, regarding the pal uh, we pallopharyngeal incompetence yeah, yeah, Look, yeah. you are doing uh, a lot of series and uh, cleft work so i am asking uh, primary primary do you have any uh, like uh, fixed protocol this type of uh, palate like uh, uh, group 2 palate and group 3 and only soft palate sub mucus cleft so do you prefer any uh, which type of uh, surgery for the palate repair and uh, the result uh, what you are getting based on that like you have the data so that's why if okay, you can uh, give some information regarding that yes ma'am ma'am sub mucosal and cleft of soft palate for loss that is a standard okay. procedure anyway yeah for due yeah. for view 2 we have actually done a randomized study of doing both the furlows and uh, uh, intervellar velloplasty and we found okay. that there is not much of a difference of there is no significant difference in lengthening for view 2 okay. for view 3 okay. it is usually intervellar velloplasty it is uh, very difficult without a large relaxing incision to manage with furlows alone it is usually okay. Cardiac and intervellar velloplasty okay. or Langenbach's intervellar velloplasty. Okay. 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 So, uh, in uh, what percentage of your cases uh, the oh. velloplasty incompetence is uh, detected, madam? Ma'am, uh, literature says it's five to twenty-three percent. In our uh, center, we started from twenty sixteen. It is around. 15 15 to 20 percent we we are finding uh, okay the so, primary cases uh, that we did initially they are coming back with vp i know so, okay okay so uh, after five uh, five years you will assess and uh, intervene accordingly yes ma'am yes ma'am okay. wonderful madam thanks a lot uh, for sharing your experience i invite dr bhattacharya sir is a senior uh, plastic surgeon with a uh, lot of experience uh, to uh, make some remarks and uh, uh, share his experience in uh, velopharyngeal incompetence well first of all i compliment dr chatterjee for a very nice precise presentation uh i have certain yes, queries sir. one is that uh, when do you do nasal endoscopy at around 5 years of age sir but you are operating at the before 1 year of age isn't it no that is palate primary palate sir ah uh, i'm talking of palate only so when when do you do suppose uh, there is a case uh, having say 1 and 1/2 year old child and having cleft palate So, will you do yes, nasal endoscopy yes. in that case? No, sir. No, sir. So, uh, then routinely, when do you do nasal endoscopy? Is it only to assess your operative uh, performance uh, at the age of five years, or pre-operatively also? No, we usually don't do nasal endoscopy pre pre-operatively. Because you have we... been insisting insisting on nasal endoscopy, that's why I thought that when you are doing it, because Uh, no, in this, it has to be done under GA, isn't it? 
Yes, sir. So, if so you we have... wanted to, we wanted to see nasoendoscopy in every pallet cases, but it is not operationally feasible. Also, to right. check so, the station tube and all. That's what I was asking. That you cannot give a separate GA for nasoendoscopy. No, only no, thing no. Is, no, no. Only sir. thing is, prior to surgery, you can always do it. Uh, yes. In almost every case. So that is one point which I wanted to ask. And uh, second thing is regarding uh, speech therapy. Because yes, I, in my experience of say more than 45 years or so, yes, so sir. speech therapy certainly forms a very, very important aspect of uh, ultimate result. Yes, sir. So in that case, uh, suppose uh, the child has uh, year, two, two scenarios can be there. One, whom you have opted at the age of one year, one whom you have operated at the age of five years. Yes, sir. So the uh, because speech therapy needs to be started maybe approximately after say three months or so after surgery. Yes, sir. And uh, so when you operate at the age of one year and when the patients come for follow-up at the age of five years, what happens to these patients during the last four years? So Regarding Sir, practically not much. We call them yearly and they usually come yearly. But uh, for far distant patients, it is very difficult for them to have speech therapy at their native place. Okay. So, so suppose, uh, suppose the patient comes. Ideally, uh, some patients do come. Some patients from, uh, say, in Dehradun, they have good speech therapy centers. So they do come. From around three years, they start and actually we get a better results in those cases. Because uh, in our country, speech therapists are, there is lack, you know, lack of speech therapists. Yes, yes. So sir. every department have to uh, sort of uh, frame their own method to deliver speech therapy. Yes. Sir. And speech therapy has two segments. One is the, you know, exercise to make the repaired palates and yes, mobile. Sir. Yes. And the other segment is actual speech therapy. Now, it can, the patient cannot, even if a speech therapist is available, the patient cannot go every day to speech therapist. Yes. So, in that situation, what is your advice? How, you, how do you follow and maintain the, these two segments of speech therapy? Sir, actually, we have had a very interesting thing done during the COVID, but I'm trying to follow it up now. During COVID, we were actually doing online therapy. Online. So uh, we had had a group created in our own state. So we had our uh, AIMS speech therapists used to sit down every week with two or three of these kids. And uh, actually the results came out to be very well. But now naturally the normal pressure has come back. So we can't give that amount of time. What so, I feel is that even if speech therapy is available, the parents cannot take the child every day yes. for one and yes. a half to two years to the space therapist. Yes. Uh, I feel that the parents are to be emphasized and explained and in detail. They are the people who will give space therapy and recording, etc. Okay. So this is what I I I uh, do uh, for several decades, and that gives very. You have to emphatically impress and express to the parents that we have done our job. Now the speech result depends upon you. So, and in depending upon their individual uh, state of uh, patients. So suppose uh, in, in Hindi, you have to explain in a different way. In Tamil, you have to explain in different way. In Bengali, you have to explain in different way so that the parents can advocate exactly the speech therapy. So right. this is the this is the practical thing which I thought I will just emphasize. And second thing is about uh, pharyngoplasty. Uh, you have said that a superiorly based pharyngeal flap is the preferred flap. Correct, absolutely agreed. Uh, my point is for the sake of PGs, uh, I, I would like you to emphasize that when you raise the flap and switch it to the uh, divided posterior soft palate, and you have sutured the you know, palatal layer. How do you line the nasal aspect of the superiorly based pharyngeal flap? Otherwise, it will it will just roll and become a string. So, how do you line a superiorly based pharyngeal flap? 
so that it doesn't roll and become a string. It maintains its configuration. Sir, <clears throat> sir, please, please tell me what you do. Yes, I will tell. You. I will tell. You. <laughs> I I actually uh, I have been following Dr. Mukund Reddy's uh, technique for the last two years. So there he puts the flap inside the furloughs. So uh, it is lined on both sides. When we are raising the furloughs, he's just pulling the furloughs, the two ends of the furloughs, uh, posterior flaps to the very base of the superiorly uh, base pharyngeal flap. So the entire flap is being incorporated into the soft palate and the soft palate is hitched up. I like the technique. I've got good results with that. So I usually follow that way. But traditionally, yeah. sir. It will not automatically get lined. Especially yes. the proximal part of the uh, flap because it is it is hanging, you know, before yes. this the palate. So what we what is done is standard procedure. It's not my procedure. While dividing after dividing the soft palate posteriorly, you make a reverse V cut, maintaining the blood supply on either side of the divided flap, and then unfold it. Just like as we unfold the prepuce of a hypospedius, right? Uh, uh, in hypospedius before cordy, after during cordy correction, so you make a V, reverse V, so that posteriorly based flap is possible to unfold. So the soft palate is made into one layer, right? And then suture half of the on either side, the to line the superiorly based pharyngeal flap. So then it will almost at least halfway through the pharyngeal flap, it will line it very nicely. Just three stitches on either side. Okay. Okay. So that right. will prevent this uh, tubing and curling. Otherwise, the effect of pharyngoplasty will be reduced. So, and the other thing is, uh, again, for the PG's purpose, how do you decide the plane of dissection of the pharyngeal flap? It is up to the prevertebral fascia. We see the white, uh, pearly white fascia beneath. And that is the bloodless plane. That is the only bloodless plane. And it is very difficult to keep that bloodless. Because once it starts bleeding from the posterior pharyngeal wall, it's very difficult to control. Yeah. So when you make the U-shaped incision, it should be deep enough. And once you start dissecting, you will find that glistening prevertebral fascia. And then you just, you know, strip it off, open your scissor and it strips off. And another thing I think for the PGs to understand is what should be the maximum width of the pharyngeal flap? Of Sir, course, it depends uh, on the patient, but maximum width. Maximum width, uh, classically, it has been said up to two-third of the total aperture, maximum. But... Uh, we usually keep it uh, just like Dr. Reddy said. It was it has to be one centimeter, around one by one centimeter. So I usually keep it at one by one centimeter. But uh, for the PGs, at least there has to be two good lateral ports. Otherwise, uh, post-operative respiratory complications are going to be. Actually, seen. two two points are important. One is the opening of the nas uh, the auricular. Uh, the, uh, to the pharynx, eustachian tube. tube. So that guides you because you should not, you know, venture upon that area. And yes. the other, so that guides you, the eustachian tube opening. And the second thing is the advantage of uh, uh, more wider flap as per required of the patient is when you primarily close the donor site, that reduces yes. the volume posteriorly. So the so the, it has a good effect on the velopharyngeal incompetence because pharyngeal wall is sutured, it is narrow. So it is an additional advantage of having the primary closure of the uh, donor site, uh, which we usually always do it. We never leave it like that. Yeah, these were the questions which I wanted to just discuss. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we uh, recommend the patients uh, of uh, operated palates uh, to blow the balloons and uh, whistle. Exactly. Yes, uh, moth uh, organ playing of, with moth organ. 
and uh, of good uh, repair and assurance uh, we flute and all uh, we uh, to encourage the palate uh, exercises and uh, as sir said uh, is very, very useful balloon inflation because yes, the balloon, very very interesting yes so sir. they have to blow very hard yes sir Whistle, mouth organ. Whistle, mouth organ. All these things we ask the, uh, them to do, and uh, 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 speech therapy. We, uh, as I said, uh, we train the uh, parents and oral drilling of the uh, different uh, words uh, at their home itself uh, before starting the physiotherapy, uh, speech therapy by speech therapist because. Many institutes they don't have any these facilities, so yeah. maximum we have to train the parents and uh, make them listen and uh, repeat the uh, mm. uh, different different uh, words, rhymes, and all those things. So uh, in our country, we have to train like that. Yes. So, madam and sir, you have nicely discussed about it. So uh, we'll go to the second part of uh, today's program.